decoding, or I should say demystifying your lab results. This is the first in a series of posts that are going to discuss blood tests and what they mean to you in the context of the choices you make on a daily basis related to your exercise, your nutrition, your diet, your nutritional supplements, etc. Now, why should you know this information? Well, on the one hand, your life may depend on it. And on the other hand, it's incredibly interesting. And in my opinion, easy to understand. And the parts of it that are worth understanding are the very parts that your doctor really doesn't share with you, not because they don't know it, but because that's not their job. Their job is to preempt crisis, to manage crisis, to avoid crisis, but their job is not really to sit down, need a knee with you and discuss how your daily behaviors can actually be impacting your blood work, which is a proxy or a reflection of your health. You see, in our current system, we look at blood test results as a way of deciding whether or not you may or may not need medical intervention. And that's only going to occur when there's something actually wrong with you. In this series of posts, we're not here to teach you how to become a doctor. We're not here to teach you how to become anything but an expert in yourself and what you need to do to basically become the healthiest that you can be. And blood work is just one example or one model for how you can make those decisions. Now there's other models for determining what decisions you could make. It's how you feel, it's how you look. So there's, there's a lot of different ways you can make decisions about the choices that you make, but blood work can be a very valuable tool and it's far easier to understand than our culture would have you believe. But before we get started, make sure you hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell so you're notified anytime we put out our new videos. And don't forget to tell all of your friends and share with them. So the information I'm going to share with you here is how I use this information for myself. I'm not here to diagnose or treat any of you out there in the social media world, but rather I'm here to kind of explain to you my thought process on how I read these results and apply them to myself as it relates to the things that we've been talking about, nutrition exercise, nutritional supplements, etc. So this series is going to be broken down into different categories. One of the categories that I want to break it down into is everything that influences how you deliver oxygen. So oxygen is something that is certainly in the air and we use our lungs to expand and take the oxygen in. And then once the oxygen filters through the lungs and into the bloodstream, well, that's where we're going to get involved. We're going to look at all of the markers associated with a routine blood test that can give us information information about your ability to deliver oxygen to your body. Now, why is that? You know, maybe it's, we, we should take it for granted, right? If you're up and about breathing air and thinking and, and moving around and not passing out, well, then you can deliver oxygen. And sure, that may be true, but that would be more of the medical model. Let's look at it a little deeper and say to ourselves, okay, understanding why we deliver oxygen is super important. Why? Because our cells need oxygen. Which cells need oxygen? All cells need oxygen, right? However, some cells use oxygen at a faster pace or a greater rate than others. And I would say the most oxygen sensitive organ in the human body is your central nervous system. Just think your brain. That's because your brain is probably 2% of your body weight and can use up to 30% of your oxygen. So therefore, it's a very oxygen thirsty system. And if there's anything that interferes with that oxygen delivery, or if that oxygen delivery isn't optimal, it could result in nervous system problems or nervous system symptoms and I'll explain what those things are. So when it comes to understanding your oxygen system or your ability to deliver oxygen, we have to say, well, what's the vehicle that carries oxygen around? So when the air enters your lungs th through the mechanism of breathing, the blood passes past those little pockets down at the end of your lungs called alveoli, and it'll exchange gases. It'll, it'll offload, just imagine the truck comes by, we'll call it a red blood cell truck. It will offload the CO2, which makes room on the truck to add O2. So you release carbon dioxide and you take in oxygen. That oxygen jumps on the truck and gets delivered through the body to the tissues that need it. In this case, we're putting an emphasis on the brain, but your skin, your muscles, your liver, your kidneys, there's a lot of oxygen sensitive tissues in the body. We just say that the central nervous system is demanding the most. And I talk about the central nervous system also because after all, it's the one system that controls all of those other important systems in your body. So we want the brain and nervous system to be functioning at the highest level possible. So your liver, your digestion, your kidneys, 
your muscles, all of those things can have the fuel that they need. And in this case, the half of the fuel equation that we're talking about is oxygen. There is another half of the fuel equation, and that's going to be hydrocarbons, right? Our food, that could be carbohydrates like glucose. It could be fat. It could be protein. It could be lactate. There's other sources of fuel, but usually we take the carbon fuel and the oxygen, put it into the cell, into the engine of the cell. We call it a mitochondria. It will combust and create energy called a ATP, just like your car will take air from the outside, gasoline, put it into the engine where it combusts and creates energy called horsepower. So it's a very similar analogy and it works very well, but it, it goes to oxygen is just being such a basic factor for human health. That's why I want to spend a lot of time on this because when you look at your blood test and say to yourself, what can I learn from my blood test that can tell me about my oxygen delivery and then what can I do about it? So that's the purpose of this video is to, by the end of the video, you should be able to pull out your last blood test, the CBC, the part of the blood test that is really just the most basic and the most commonly ordered. A CBC through, you know, most of the states in this country, you could get for, for $3. It's called a complete blood count. And it has a count of your red blood cells and your white blood cells. We're going to be discussing the red blood cells since their job is only to deliver oxygen. And the characteristics of the red blood cell are super important to tell us about lifestyle and dietary and nutritional challenges you may or not be having. So your red blood cells, you know, you have to have enough of them, right? Their job is to deliver oxygen. You have to have enough of them, but they also have to have certain characteristics. Their size is important. Their percentage is important. The protein inside of them that's made from iron, we call it hemoglobin, which actually is what is binding the oxygen. That's super important. So we're going to look at your CBC and say, okay, how many red blood cells do I have? We care about what the number is. We don't necessarily have to memorize all the other things. So we want to know that your red blood cells are between 4.75 and 5.25 in adult males and between 4.5 and 5.25 in adult females. Now, the reason why it's lower in adult females is because most women who are not menopausal have a monthly cycle that causes them to lose blood and have to remanufacture those red blood cells. So the numbers for women for the red blood cells are a little bit lower. Now, I said 4.5. Some people would say that's crazy. It may be 4.25. Okay, so what I'm saying is the reference range, so there's when you look at your blood test, on the left is what was measured, red blood cell or RBC. To the right of that is your number, whatever it may be. Some people it's 3.9, some people it's 4.7, some people it's 6.1. But then to the right of that is what's called the reference range. Now the reference range is not a measure of healthy and unhealthy, sick and not sick. It's a measure of common and uncommon. It's really just a community rating. That number is actually different from laboratory to laboratory, city to city and state to state. And there's different reasons for that that I won't get into. But it really is compared comparing you to your neighbors, and there's good reason for doing that. However, the unintended consequences are, well, who are your neighbors? <laughs> are they the healthiest among us, or are they the sickest among us? And of course, you could imagine they are the sickest among us, and therefore, that reference range on the lab report is very wide. So what we have done is gone to the biochemists who come up with these numbers and said, hey, what are the numbers for the healthiest among us? What, what are the optimal numbers? So the optimal numbers for red blood cells for men is 4.75 to 5. 25, for women, 4.5 to 5.25. And anything below that would be considered suboptimal. It could be meaningful and it may not. The next number is called hemoglobin. It's usually abbreviated as HGB. That's the protein inside the red blood cell that is made from iron that binds the oxygen, which is super important. And that number in men should be above 14 and women should be above 13. And it shouldn't be too high either, right? It shouldn't go above 17 in men or above 16 in women. There's different reasons why that would happen. So we need your red blood cell number to be optimal. We need your hemoglobin number to be optimal. And then there's something called hematocrit. And hematocrit's important. It tells us what percentage of cells in your blood are red blood 
blood cells, and that number ideally is between 40 and 45. For women, you could say 38.5, 45. When it goes above 45, it's typically not a problem. However, there are a lot of people are taking hormone therapy. They're taking, you know, testosterone replacement therapy, and large number of women are taking hormone or testosterone replacement therapy. And one of the things testosterone does is it actually increases the manufacture of red blood cells. So people who are taking too much testosterone will have red blood cells above 5.25, and they'll have a hematocrit above 50%, and they'll have hemoglobin above 17. And then what we start to see is an increase in viscosity. Just think about your, your blood, if it's supposed to be more like red wine and it winds up being like ketchup, well, now you have a situation where the blood can't really squeeze through those very tiny blood vessels and you can cause a stroke. You can actually cause a problem. So if you are on testosterone replacement therapy, you should have your doctor always be checking your red blood cells to make sure you don't have too much. Now in the context of this talk, most people are, they have too little. Their red blood cells are low. Their hemoglobin is low their hematocrit is low. And then we say, what's the final or the fourth marker? The fourth marker that we would discuss here, there are others, but we're gonna just for simplicity's sake, keep it very simple. Something called MCV or mean corpuscular volume. All that means is the size of the red blood cell. A really tiny red blood cell doesn't deliver oxygen very well. A blood cell that's too big doesn't deliver oxygen very well. So if the red blood cells are enough and the hemoglobin is adequate and the hematocrit is what it should be, but the MCV is low, well then you still have a problem delivering oxygen. So we want all four of these markers to be as optimal as can be. Now the reference range for MCV could be anywhere from 80 to 100, 79 to 97. It just depends on what laboratory you're in, but we say between 82 and 92, okay? That's the sweet spot. Above 92, they're a little big. Below 82, they're a little tiny. Small red blood cells, doctors call this microcytosis. Who cares what they call it? We'll call it small red blood cells. Under 82, an MCV under 82 is usually caused by an iron deficiency. And if it's above 92, it's usually related to, or could be related to, vitamin B12, just to, for simplicity's sake. Now, that's important. So now we just mentioned two nutrients found in our food that could give us a clue as to whether or not we're gonna have challenges delivering oxygen. And again, oxygen is your primary source of fuel. It's where we're starting this conversation because it's so important to your central nervous system. So now we went over the four major markers found in your CBC. Now, if you're fortunate enough for your doctor to have checked three other markers, vitamin B12, vitamin B9, also known as folate or folic acid, and then finally iron, but best measured in the form of ferritin. The storage form of iron is more significant or more important to understand. So now if you have your CBC and you have your vitamin B12, your folate or your vitamin B9, and your ferritin or iron, we gather a lot more information because those are the three ingredients that help us make red blood cells healthy red blood cells. Stay tuned, make sure you hit that notification bell, tell all your friends, this is gonna be the place where you're gonna to learn to become an expert in yourself and what you need to express health and how to understand your own blood tests as it relates to making decisions. There are other things that we're gonna talk about that help you make decisions. We're not here to be your doctor, we're not here to teach you to be a doctor or to be somebody else's doctor, but rather we're here to teach you to optimize your health and well-being through diet, lifestyle, and exercise.